and welcome to the Mancunian Candidates here on Fab Radio International and YouTube. Um, my name's Paul Ripley and... And I'm Mike Royce and it's been a very interesting week. We are host, hosting Donald Trump's Going Away Do later on and we're going to start by having a look at what's going on in the UK and talking about lots of other stuff, aren't we? Lots of other stuff. But we've got to make an apology, I suppose, um, but you'll understand why when I say this. We've concentrated on the American situation more so than ever uh, in the last few months for obvious reasons. And, and tonight will probably be the end of that, where we're a bit more balanced in stuff that's going on in the UK. We've ignored some of that while the American situation, and it is, has been a situation to say the least, has been going on. But we'll be going back to lots of UK stuff and a balance from next week, I suppose, is a better way of saying it. Uh, but here, some news, some late breaking news I've just heard is that there's been an outbreak in Scotland of at a, um, an old person's home where they've only had one injection. One injection. So the, the idea of we could just inject people once and it will contain this virus isn't really working because there's been an outbreak. A staff have got it, people are ill. These details are coming through we need all the to time. Know, we need to be careful with with how we receive this information. Yeah. We need more information. I don't want to start on this show panicking people into thinking that the the virus, and unless you've had both doses, it doesn't work. I'm sure that there is some uh, protection from having one dose, but I the you've got to look at the way that these tests were conducted. The vaccines were tested with two doses those yeah. results of 90 odd percent yeah. were with two doses not with one and there is uh have you heard that there are other countries that are coming back and saying that the result after only one dose of the moderna vaccine yeah. is only 38 percent yeah so it's important so it's a mixture so that'll be carried on obviously it'll break but the news i want to talk about before we start the show is uh, for people who know me, um, I'm a big fan of the music scene. I've been involved with the music scene for many, many years, uh, over my lifetime here in Manchester. And the, the Brexit, I mean, the Brexit situation as if is, is gonna destroy, as at the moment, unless things change, the touring live scene for um, UK bands because of this reason. To go and tour, and don't forget, you don't make money anymore from sales. I mean, someone was telling me the other day he had something like a million, a million downloads, or a million streams, sorry, on Spotify, and they got some like 30 odd quid. But, so they make money soaring. But to go into Europe now, it's an absolute nightmare. You need certain permits. You need certain, I've got in fact visas uh, for each country you go into, but the permits for every instrument range from 350 quid. Also, adding to that, if you've got a guitar, I mean, lots of people have certain aged guitars, certain rosewood maybe on that instrument, you cannot enter that country with that guitar because of the wood that's been on the instrument. Yeah. Did you know that, Mike? No, I didn't. But so it they're sense. doing the, the, well, it doesn't make sense. Oh, it the does idea. with the constrictions that we were expecting. It, it makes sense that there'd be lots of different rules I mean, if you that go we back didn't to understand. Yeah, if you go back to, I mean, even on the, the world of classical music, certain violins won't hit that criteria. And you've got to, get on this one, have a, every single piece of equipment that's going to be taken abroad has to be identified and a sheet made and it's going to be signed off. So that includes little things like, say, that size to a great big speakers. It, there's thousands and thousands of bits of kit required to go on tour. It's going to destroy one of the greatest industries this country has ever produced, which is the music scene. You just look at it. Over the years, the people that have been has generated, the music has been generated from here across America, across the world, and it's going to be destroyed because of Brexit. There, there is no thought gone into many aspects okay. of this. This is one of these areas, and there are other great areas. 
in in this and I'm not we'll get back to obviously the music scene is is important to me I've got a live music venue that's yeah. remaining it, it's shut now and I want to reopen it but uh, what am I going to reopen am I going to reopen it are they going to be bands able to perform are they still going well, to be people you must have had so many bands from around the Europe playing at your venue loads of them absolutely what loads. makes me laugh though is Roger Daltrey who's a big Brickers tier yes a couple of years ago he yeah. went on oh we don't need control like this get rid of this Gestapo type thing yeah, well, in you Europe. Go. He changed his mind now. Yeah, of course he's changed, changed his, his mind. mind. Yeah, as have many people in the UK who this week started to get parcels that they'd ordered off Amazon and eBay and various other places and have suddenly ended up with an £80 fee or higher on items that probably cost less than that to buy. Yeah. They, the, the duties that are being imposed at this end now, because they have to, to recoup the costs of, of entry into our country that's not part of the EU, are now going off the scale. So that little DVD that you'd buy that was only you got from Germany, uh, and now you paid 20, 20 quid for, probably cost two quid postage. You there, Your postman's there knocking you up at 8.30 in the morning and he's saying, oh, I want uh, 40 quid on top. So the, the, the DVD so the, Blu-ray is yeah. costing you 60 quid yeah. and the same goes for music and imported music and all the rest of it. The, that is the tip of the iceberg and this music situation that Paul's actually going on about here is um, it's, it's yet to get as bad as it's going to get. This is going to get worse. Absolutely. The prime example is the girl bought a coat. Yeah, a coat off Amazon, but the supplier was in France. Two hundred and eighty pound. So you paid two hundred, like I said. Knock, yes. knock, knock on the door. Post them eighty pound, please. So you, what you've got now in all the private vendors that use Amazon, ninety-five percent of them this week have decided not to supply to the UK. So all of those places that you were buying stuff from all over Europe now, ninety-five percent of the vendors that are not that, as you know, Amazon sell its own <coughs> stock. Yeah. And Amazon also have lots of wonderful independent companies that provide services and they use Amazon as a go-to. And they are not shipping now to the UK because they cannot find a way of making it cost effective with all the fees. And just one more thing to add on the music scene situation is you think about a band going on tour. Well, it's not just a band that's involved. Say a band's got four or five members. It's all the team around them, the roadies the support staff, the mixers, the engineers, the lighting engineers, every single one of them has to have the permit and a visa for each country. And you can only do a maximum of 90 days and three countries. It's knackered. Yeah. Knackered. Yeah. But before we go on, I've got to reply to a few things. Eddie, uh, who was in touch with us last week, one of the, one of the, one of the early candidates, I would yes. say. He's, he sends us a message, and, and we'll, Eddie will be appearing for fans of Eddie. Uh, Eddie Sheehy, uh, he sends us a message the other week, which you got to reply for. I'm always just seeing it now. Uh, what does his message say, Chris? Uh, it says, you are buffering and it shouldn't be anything at my end. You are buffering and it shouldn't be anything at... Uh, I take it you're going to deal with this. Um, well, Eddie, it doesn't quite work that way. Um, um, it, it is at your end. Um, it is your internet, or it is your you computer. You can't buffer at the other you end, as they say, and end. that's not a euphemism. Now, <laughs> now I asked to add this. I mean, I'm not, I'm not going to show him up. He'll laugh about it. But Eddie used to teach computers at the university. He teaches about computers. Uh, he comes up with messages like that. Eddie, you're a star. Uh, you're in Ireland. You'll be back soon. Uh, hope to see you. And hope, we'll hopefully get you on the show in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but my goodness, don't send me emails like that. Yeah. You but are showing something your capabilities are about the internet and i'd like to say thank you we've we've had a few um bits and bobs but the one that uh, that got me somebody spent the time was a bit offended by the trump impeachment section on last week's show yeah. and he uh, found, found me on twitter um to give me a bit of grief and inform me that i'm an eskimo faced cunt um I don't know what to say to that. It's a new one. And um, thank you very much. Uh, I'm impressed with the amount of effort you put in to deliver it that piece of information. What, what, what does an Eskimo yeah. face what, what, look like? What I don't know. Uh, I don't think I look like an Eskimo. 
but it's not something I've ever really given much consideration to until this week. This show is just grabbing the crazy from out of nowhere, isn't it? You know. Can I call you that in the future? Is no, that, you well, can't call me that in the future. It annoyed me that much. I blocked him, and I was I was oh, in the no. middle of getting ready. Well, I didn't think, did I? I'm not. I'm not having an argument over why I don't look like an Eskimo. Yeah, you know, can you imagine that? Perhaps it's the hair. No, it's not the hair. They you don't have hair like fair. this. <laughs> I don't. I don't have a clue. I, I need to. I will find out what it means at some point. Uh, later you know. in the show, we are joining Joe from New York, from Queens in New York, and because while this um, change has been going on, this, the handing over of power, certain, certain things have been going on in New York which you need to be aware of, and Joe will be bringing that to our attention. But the UK was relieved. Apparently, all our press was relieved that we had finally got rid of a certain president. And the headlines from the newspapers showed this. If we could show some clips. The Daily Star was a cracker. Yeah, so we'll just show you a few headlines from uh, what was going on uh, in the last couple of days. And I, I actually laughed out loud while these were being shown. Um, the Daily Star one. The Daily Star was amazing Literally. because because of the expression on Trump's face and yeah. the fire and the fury and well that was a weird dream. Uh, that's a great one. If we can find the Metro, I really appreciated the graphic design elements on yeah. that one because of the 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 use of the flag, the bit of space there, and the fact that Biden arriving was so insignificant compared to the big thing they wanted to get into, which was him going. Yeah. Um, and then we got into um, Biden blitzing Trump's legacy, which uh, which was a nice cover because it turns out that he certainly is. I mean, later on in the show, we'll be going through some of the things since Trump's gone. Um, he's not he's sort of at the ground running, to be honest, which is, is great. And then finally, we've we've got uh, McConnell, who we'll be dealing with later, who's uh, blaming Trump now for the events uh, openly blaming Trump which is what we wanted because that does mean that a certain impeachment might go the right way and don't forget uh, Boris and May when she went over to America tied themselves hoping for this deal that this uh, this great deal will leave oh, the yeah. EU and we'll see how that turns out over the next few months if it's anything to do which oh, turn into something like the music business uh, nonsense uh, it should be quite well I mean in Northern Ireland apparently certain stores run out of food fresh foods uh, I can see us we're just at the beginning we're just at the beginning and can I say uh, when we've been for years on the show prophesizing massive increases in imported goods massive increases in things you're buying from the EU all the things that we were talking about it isn't I told you so it's just it isn't surprising to us on the Mancunian candidates that this has turned out to be the case it wasn't project fear it was project fact and that also project fact well, you've got to remember uh, some prophecies that we made heading into Christmas where I said that Christmas was not going to be great. I put it in more colourful terms than that, if I remember. And uh, we, it turns out that on Tuesday we hit a particular landmark. Let's bring you more on the latest infection numbers and the number of people who have died of coronavirus in the UK in the last 24 hours. Emma Birchley is in the newsroom, has been having a look at the figures for us. Emma. Yes, and the most shocking thing actually is the number of people who have died. So uh, that figure has been put at 1,610. It's the highest number that we have seen um, throughout this pandemic uh, in this country um, and significantly higher than yesterday uh, where the figure was 599. A, a better comparison is actually to look week on week. So if we look at last Tuesday, um, the figure was 1,243. So an increase of not far off 400 on last week. Also, when we look at the number of people who have tested positive, 
in the past 24 hours. That figure put at 33,355. Now, that's actually down uh, on 37,500 yesterday and 12,000 down on this time last week, which is once again the much more useful comparison looking week on week. Um, and that has to be a good sign, you would hope, uh, because, of course, um, if you've got fewer people testing positive, that means fewer people ultimately ending up in hospital and very sadly then losing their lives. We have also uh, the figure of how many people have had their first dose of the vaccination. So that's 4.27 million people, up from 4.06 million people yesterday. Actually, there's a slight slowing down in the rate that they appear to be vaccinating at the moment. We were seeing 300,000 a day. This is more like um, 200,000. Uh, sorry, yeah, 200,000. But still, you know, this is an enormous task. But I think the headline of these really dreadful figures is that 1,610 people in these latest figures who've lost their lives within 28 days of a positive test. Yeah, absolutely scary stuff. Scary stuff. And they've got some figures here. At the moment, there's 38,676 people in hospital right now as we talk. Uh, and just before, literally, um, was it... 1290 deaths today unbelievable unbelievable and a guy who i know i won't name and shame uh but he's called paul and lives in draws and he's on facebook they're going on oh i'm dreading this gates needle that's going to go into me and yeah. turn me yeah oh for god's Stupid. sake bastard i have no i've literally no tolerance for this now and i'll just say there is a graph that you can easily find online and it shows where we were at Christmas and then it shows when we went into lockdown and as you know the figures all lag by two to three weeks and you can see the other countries in the EU that did not have the little come by our Christmas and decided to uh, kill each other for Christmas they actually just stayed at home locked down so that they didn't spread it phoned the loved ones told them they loved each other, did a bit of FaceTime and a Zoom meeting here and there, a, a Zoom call, you know, throughout the day. And, and they are on a downward trajectory. And we reached on Tuesday the highest level of deaths since this entire saga began. The, you had 1,600 people dead there. You, you have got... Uh, you, everything is kicking in now from Christmas Day. That one day has now added weeks and weeks and weeks and more importantly thousands of dead people that didn't need to die just because you're a bunch of pussies that couldn't do without Christmas Day as you remember it. Well, do you know what? There's now going to be some people who won't be around for next Christmas Day because of you, you bunch of absolute balance. Um, to me, Mike, it's always about um, who governs it and to me... Boris Johnson's got blood on his hands. Of course he has. He, he, he got rid of science. He ignored science to chase some mythical dream of a Christmas day because he felt that politically he would do better yeah. if everybody was happy for that week and had the Christmas day <laughs> and all the rest of it. He didn't. And, and I'll just say this. You're seeing that figure there, 1,600 dead there. You're seeing all of this. Imagine if we'd have done the five days now. Imagine the carnage that we'd be going through now. I suggested that this would be a cauldron of death in January. Well, we're in the middle of the cauldron and the person who put all the stuff into the pot is Boris Johnson. And talking of Boris Johnson, that mop-headed wanker was caught today leaving his house and he was pressured on, to, on the question of when this lockdown will end. Are we looking at summer rather than spring? I think it's too early to say when uh, we'll be able to lift some of the some of the restrictions we're, we're looking at that february the 15th deadline as you know for the uh, the jcvi groups one to four the the elderly the vulnerable groups that we want to vaccinate first at 15 million uh, people across the the uk that we want to have been offered uh, a vaccination slot by the 15th of february we'll look then at how we're how we're doing but i think what we're seeing in the in the ons data in the REACT survey, we're seeing the 
uh, the the contagiousness of the of the new variant that we saw arrive just before Christmas. There's no doubt it does spread uh, very fast I indeed. It's not more uh, deadly, but it is much more contagious, and the numbers are, are very great. So, as we get the vaccination program out there, as we continue to expand, and I think we're up to uh, 4.6 million people today, uh, 5 million jabs, we've got to observe the the lockdown, the stay at home message, uh, protect each other, protect the NHS. That's absolutely crucial in, the, in what is unquestionably going to be a tough few weeks ahead. Tough because you brought it on. Tough because you brought it on. And there he is smirking all over his face, doing all the usual was, uh, stuff he does. I don't understand it. And you know what? What's really quite bizarre is seeing him in a high-vis jacket because you, you associate a high-vis jacket with somebody who works hard, who does manual labour, who is quite a, a hard-working person. And it doesn't do him much no. favours. I mean, it doesn't suit him, does it? Let's just say that. Um, and the other thing... He's not calling it a super strain anymore, is he? Remember that one, that little faux pas that turned us into a plague ship on the edge of Europe where no one wanted to come and visit or send any goods to and gave us a lovely no-deal Brexit for a week yep. for no reason whatsoever yep. other than that he's stupid. Stupid. Uh, I still can't get over people. And now the, the, we're going to talk about Trump, but, but Trump uh, uh, and you know, Boris is our Trump. Simple as that. He's our Trump. Oh yeah. But but he yeah. is responsible. Trump uh, and people jumping on this right wing, thinking it's going to be the, the future, is responsible for Brexit. End story. He's responsible for Brexit. The people that died into like the Americans. Mm. Certain Americans jumped onto the Trump bandwagon. Certain people here, you would think, are normal people, suddenly started to believe in that Boris and Brexit is the right for, way for, for the same reason that Europe would have been proved right because all the way through the 60s into the 1970s um, we were we were shown by France France didn't want us in they vetoed us from joining Europe because they said you, we had a transatlantic notion we were more interested in having the nuclear deterrent and being part of the nuclear club with America and being, being friends with them and dealing with them and that we would eventually go back to being cosy with them and we weren't natural Europeans and you know what we argued and went of course not and we've ended up proving them right congratulations you bunch of bozos that voted for this but someone who's not a bozo, I've been just been told by Chris over there that um, we have to change things around slightly. Yeah, right, okay. Uh, well, let's deal with. Well, let's let's find out what Joe thinks about what's been going on with in, Trump. Trump's gone. Let's deal with it in New York City. Indeed. Hi hello. guys. Hey, hello. Long time no talky. Yeah. Can you hear me all right? Absolutely, Joe. Fantastic, Absolutely. Joe. It's lovely to see you. So, um, what, what, you're having yeah. revolutions now. Well, we've been gone. <laughs> what are you doing? Playing that? Uh, oh, the revolution. Uh, and while uh, there's a great sense of relief to, um, you know, enter this new chapter in, uh, in the world, we, um, we've got a long way to go and a lot of work to do. Before I get into this, I would like to say um, there's great signs of hope for our future in the form of none other than, none other than uh, Cesar Chavez himself is now sitting in the Oval Office in the form of a bust behind President Biden, yes. which is very promising for anyone who is on the side of civil rights and labor rights. Um, well, it's, it's, it's very impressive, actually. I was looking at photographs of the Oval Office, and I do appreciate the, the civil rights presence in there. And I'm not at all offended that uh, Conservative MP Winston Churchill has been removed. <laughs> I wasn't going to bring that up, but... Uh... <laughs> I'd have got rid of it ages ago. <laughs> but, Joe, I want to know what's going on in New York. Um, there's a strike going on. Yeah. And what's the reason behind so, um, the strike? What's the story? Right. So here in New York City, uh, as as I'm sure you can imagine, um, getting goods and 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 uh, specifically food products into the city can be a challenging task. And we have something called the Hunts Point Market, which is in the Hunts Point neighborhood of the South Bronx. <laughs> um, over the weekend, uh, workers from the produce section of that market 
uh, decided to uh, go on strike. They are currently in uh, negotiations with the employer for a new contract. So this is uh, the Teamsters Local 202 um, negotiating on behalf of the workers for a contract and they are looking for a wage increase of $1 per hour. Now to put things in perspective, these workers are making about at most $20 per hour. Yeah. Uh, these are essential workers who are tasked with uh, unloading trucks uh, filled with our food products, primarily produce, uh, unloading train cars full of produce, sorting it and getting it out to the vendors, uh, you know, loading it onto other trucks and, and getting it out to the city to feed the city. This yeah, market provides 50% of the, of the the they're food putting their the lives city. on the line as well, aren't they? Because it, it, with the right. current situation, they might as well, they might as well be doing a tour of duty in Iraq, because they, the it, chances it, of, of mortality are probably higher than that. Exactly. In, in fact, um, I don't. Numerous workers we have given their lives to doing this job sure. during this pandemic. Um, I believe six workers have unfortunately passed away yeah, from directly from the virus from work. Uh, now, to put things in perspective, we're talking about an employer, Hunts Point Market, who has, I believe it's $60 billion in revenue, all right? And the workers, like I said, are looking for a $1 per hour raise. The market has offered them 32 cents an hour yeah. as an increase. So for all their thanks, these workers who live here in New York City, which is not a cheap city. No, it isn't. I don't care where you live, even no, if you're I in the Bronx, in the South Bronx. Um, $20 hour translates into roughly 40 grand a year. Yeah. Uh, Try and support a family on forty grand a year in New York City. What would an average, say, two-bedroom apartment cost you to rent per month in, or per year in New York? Do you think in a, in a sort of average area, not not really run down, just an average area? Sure. Uh, even just looking at the Bronx, two. Uh, I have numbers here for a one-bedroom. Yeah. Average numbers currently at. Uh, for a one bedroom, $1,800 a month. Okay. For a three bedroom apartment, $2,333 a month. Okay. So you're talking about half your annual wage just on rent. Yeah. And when yeah. you factor in other costs of living, it's, yeah. you know, we're talking about workers who are forced to rely on overtime and second and even third jobs, multi uh, income households in order just to survive. Yeah. And many of these workers are people that for whatever the reason might be, have no place else to go. So what many Americans uh, enjoy, uh, you know, the, enjoy the freedom of movement of saying, okay, I don't want to live in Dayton anymore. I'm going to take this job in Indianapolis. And they moved to Indianapolis because the cost of living is similar. Yeah. The culture is similar. We're talking about workers who are here in New York City. This is their home. This is where their families are. Their brothers and sisters have literally given their lives to working during this pandemic. Yeah. And they now they're on strike. And how does the city respond? Well, the good people of the NYPD, of course, showed up and decided to violently attack these lawful picketers right. and detain any of them, supposedly obstructing traffic and blocking a roadway. Yeah, we had this here with and, the coal miners strike in the 1980s. Um, Thatcher wanted to break that union and she used the yeah. the police as a, a private army. Yeah. Yes, and it's just, this is just one of another example this comes, as you just mentioned, of civil servants, police officers who are paid f by my tax dollars and those workers' tax dollars being used as a military force mm. on behalf of a company. They're protecting the rights of the workers who have a legal permit uh, picketing. 
employer who's not taking care of them. And the police are using intimidation tactics, showing up with, with mounted officers and corralling the workers and, you know, detaining them and, and charging them with, with things that yeah. are just unacceptable. So, yeah. so right here in New York City, that's what's happened is so that's... our food supply cut off while an employer doesn't want to pay and take care yeah. of its workers and the police are defending the employer. And at the moment, the the rioters from the Capitol riots that were all live streaming it and providing ironclad evidence of their guilt and their intent and even making statements on social media, written statements about doing it, uh, they're, oh, quite a lot of them are getting off with very, very, very low-level charges that don't point yeah. anywhere towards an armed interaction. Do, do, you hope, yeah, do, you I, hope, uh, do you hope the situation in New York will change over the next year or so regarding the police and their policies? Because the support from Trump is obviously gone. So do you think it'll change in any way? I think it's a retraining of the police. I think, I think we're going to see a lot of major changes. Uh, currently, there is a, a lawsuit against the NYPD uh, filed by the state of New York. Our attorney general has stepped in and filed a lawsuit against the NYPD as an organization for their mistreatment of Black Lives Matter protesters over the summer. Um, right now, we, to some extent, have highlighted issues within the department, within the NYPD, that they can no longer ignore. And, uh, ignore. So you're seeing them forced into talking their way out of the corner at the moment. They've, there's so much evidence of their mistreatment and mishandling of, of the citizens of this city, and they can't continue to hide behind the blue wall or blue curtain, whatever you want to call it anymore. Mm -hmm. So I think we will see some major changes over the course of the next year, whether or not those changes are story, because we need to continue uh, getting our policy on our side, getting our people on our side elected into office at a local level, and we need to continue building strength from the bottom up. Um, yeah. Joe, I'm sorry to interrupt you here, but the line is, is terrible to be honest, and you keep cutting out, you, you're losing some of the important things you've got to say. So can, uh, we, come, okay. can we come back to you next week for, uh, to catch up again, just to, because the line's too bad. Is that okay? Absolutely. Absolutely, yes. Joe, we thank you so much from the bottom of our hearts for your contribution to the Mancunian candidates. You are a candidate and you're in New York, that's all. But really, you're a mank. We'll see you next week. Take care, Joe. Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Yeah, we're sorry about that there. The um, line was just cutting the bit. If it yeah, wanted, it's normally it's better bit. than that. But, you know, next week, maybe we can pre-record that and um, yeah. we can get a bit more Well, I think depth. it's just one of them... Um, I mean, uh, what's going on in New York? Yeah. I mean, he, Joe, just for people who have never seen the show before, Joe um, it talks about the funding behind the New York Police and the certain elements of the of the New York Police Department and how it's been, well, it's been bung money, simple as that, bung mm. money from the Trump campaign. And, well, it's having an effect, of course. The well, police, we talked to Tom. Yeah. Uh, Tom hopefully will be on the show next week as well. Tom is uh, a Republican in Alaska. And you cannot mention the police to him because his dad was a, a former police officer of a high level. But the police in America need looking at and they need to retrain and look yeah. at how they... Tom will definitely give you a different version of he events will. next week. But it will in the meantime, uh, before that, we'll just deal with what's been going yeah. on and obviously the big news that we're it's hopefully going to get us past uh, covering this guy so much and I've hated this for four years every week we used to write the show and have all sorts of varied topics and this orange faced monster that has just came on the scene four years ago and has dominated in a negative way every single episode of this show. I've gone away from every episode where we've talked about him, all despondent, yeah. all fed up. It's going to be nice to cover some other topics, but we do have to deal with what has been a, a dramatic week. And but it's not just him, is it, Mike? We covered it. I mean, I said it to you before. It's, it's like a lots. hydra. It's a well, family all around, the well, many heads, and they all need cutting off. We're going to be dealing with all of that. Now, I mean, to start off with, the 
the the week began and people were nervous because of the riots and because of uh, everything that's going on. Is Trump going to actually go or is he going to pull some last minute trick? And then all of a sudden, a video emerged of the My Pillow guy paying him a visit. The nation under siege at this moment, the nation's capital turning into a fortress as more governors activate the National Guard in their states. Tonight, that number at 14 and it's growing. And it comes ahead of warnings of armed protests starting as early as this weekend. So what did the president of the United States, the leader of the country, do at this moment of need? He hung out with the MyPillow guy. Remember Mike Lindell? You know, known for pillows, known for telling the American public to take a plant extract that would end and cure coronavirus. Well, that, that's who he met with. And look, look what Lindell had on his notes as he met with Trump. A Washington Post photographer captured it. So we'll hold it up here for a second. The document includes the words martial law, and since the Constitution, dangerous and fringe ideas still making their way inside the White House. So now, because, you know, we saw Mike Lindell and, and we saw the paper, we all now know what the president's public schedule actually meant in practice. It read, President Trump will work from early in the morning until late in the evening. He will make many calls and have many meetings. Well, we know of one meeting with the pillow guy who came equipped with notes about martial law. There you go. I mean, he, he, at the very tail end, even yeah. after you've had that insurrection, after you've had all this, the guy's impeached. You think, well, surely now he can bunker down just for the final week and not cause any controversy. Uh, and you'd think that there were some people around him, maybe his family, his core, because he was being abandoned left, right and centre. By all reports, it sounded very much like Nixon, who was spent the last week uh, before he resigned, knowing he was going to resign, talking, pissed up, wandering the, the halls of uh, the White House, talking to the ex-president's pictures, and in particular had mm. a weird relationship with JFK's portrait, who he was... Say, uh, arguing with saying well you had it easier than me didn't you Jack you know it's odd uh, Trump unfortunately doesn't drink well or fortunately can you imagine if he was a bit of a piss at what uh, how many problems we'd have had and he still took this meeting with this lunatic the my pillow guy if you're in America at any time he, the my pillow is this this amazing pillow that's supposed to help you sleep make you not snore um, make you a virile human being. It's got lots of imagery of guys waking up all virile, looking like they're going to give the wife a good scene to. And Fox um, News promoted it to death. And way. Fox News yeah. promoted it, and, and they advertised all over it. And this guy, he's one of these guys, if I say this, where, you know, when you get a product and the owner of the company, even though he's not dynamic, even though he's not handsome, even though he really shouldn't be in front of the camera, insists on promoting... Is the, it like that double product. glazing guy that yes, we said locally Ted, right here? Ted Malt, yeah. Ted Malt, Ted Malt yeah. And he just couldn't act. Yeah, hung himself. Did he? Oh, shot himself, sorry, shot himself. Oh, he, right. he took a shotgun and, and blew his head off. His son uh, still looks Damn after it. it. It's um, Everest double glazing. Right. It's a cracking little story. I didn't think he'd shoot himself. He was really depressed. Oh, apparently, um, apparently, it's a bit of a downer putting windows in. So... Yeah, the guy turns up. This guy is a Trump fan. He's a sycophant. He's been hanging around Trump from day one. He's got plenty of money from selling these pillows, so there's something to think about if you want another career change. And he has wanted him to take over the country. He's literally been telling Donald Trump that, I know you lost the election, but you've got the army, you've still got power. You might as well just tell the army to take over all 50 yeah. states and then you can remain in charge forever. And and this meeting, as you've seen, he, the, this is the problem. These people who are having meetings, you get a lot of Tory MPs slipping up like this, or do they? Are they doing it on purpose? Where they, they're captured with notes and they say stuff like, I am going to say this in the meeting, and it's like top secret stuff. And uh, no, he he went there and he had a chat with him about how to, how to bring in martial law <clears throat> and get the army to take over the country wow. and install him as a dictator. Wow. wow, on the on the run up to him leaving, uh, and apparently he he was a, a complained about Parler as well. Your Parler, the uh, app, yeah. the social media app, which got taken down by Amazon because they hosted it. Guess who else was on Parler, by the way? I don't know. Go on, um, Michael Gove. Oh, is he really? And six other, is he really? Six other 
uh, back benches. This is the this is the thing. this is the right wing yeah. little chat room. Uh, Wonderful, where they all come together. And, yeah. And, uh, oh, the right wing. On. What can I say? They, uh, so we have got uh, because of the the riots and the the issues uh, that arose over the last two weeks that we've covered copiously on here. Yeah. It turns out. You, did you know that there was an impeachment? About to begin? Well, I did do, because you, know? you told me about yeah. an hour ago. Well, let's look at this. Somebody is about to be impeached. And it's not who you think it is. Welcome, Congresswoman. Um, how do you feel about today, first of all? Well, I'm absolutely disgusted with what happened today. What the Democrats are putting the American people through is, is atrocious. It's a waste of our taxpayer dollars and they're pouring salt in the wounds of 75 million Americans who voted for President Trump. Uh, this is not why, why I wanted to come to Washington. I wanted to actually work on real problems, but it's apparent that we definitely have real problems now, Greg, and this is why I wanted to come on your show tonight. Um, I'm tired of Republicans that lay down and allow this country to be ravaged allow Democrats to abuse their power and their positions. And I believe it's time for Republicans to stand up for the American people and do a good job in Congress. Very well. Uh, and yes, 10 or so Republicans did this as well. We'll have more on that in a bit. Congresswoman, I understand though you have something uh, pressing, something important and something new you'd like to share with everybody. Yes, I, I would like to announce on behalf of the American people, we have to make sure that our leaders are held accountable. We cannot have a president of the United States that is willing to abuse the power of the office of the presidency um, and be easily bought off by foreign governments, uh, foreign Chinese or Chinese energy companies, Ukrainian energy companies. So on January 21st, I will be filing articles of impeachment on Joe Biden. Wow. Articles of impeachment on Joe Biden on his first full day as president. I'm looking at Hunter Biden right now. So uh, we're talking about Joe. Obviously, we know Hunter's got issues as well. Um, how is that going to work? You are a freshman. Uh, you're in the minority. Um, what will happen next? Is this symbolic or can you really do something uh, about this? Well, like I said, I'm, I'm a big believer in having people in office that are actually willing to do the job. And I, I can't imagine people in this country uh, being so fearful of a future of a Biden presidency that they may be willing to commit violence like they did in the Capitol here in Washington, D.C. We cannot have that. I do not condone that violence. The American people need hope. They need to know that there are Republicans in Congress that are willing to stand up and fight for them, regardless of being in a minority, regardless of having all at odds against us, against me, or against anyone in Congress. We have to hold people accountable. Joe Biden is on record on the phone saying that he would withhold a billion dollars of foreign aid if he didn't get his way with these deals with his son, Hunter. And there's an ongoing investigation with Hunter Biden's laptop. Um, into being bought and paid for by Chinese, communist Chinese energy companies. This is a dangerous threat to our country when we have a man that will be holding the power of the presidency, but yeah. um, will so easily and is on record for abusing power. So the, she is, I'm just going to go, I'm going to put it out there now. She is now. Uh, it used to be, I think, Sarah Palin in my book, uh, but she's now got it. She's got the title <clears throat> of the most stupid person in American politics. She has got to be the most brainless moron I've ever seen elected to, to a high office. She, you guys in Georgia, who re, you elected her, and you know she's batshit crazy. You know she's mad. You know she's QAnon. And you elected her. She's actually in there. There's two people in QAnon that are Republican representatives in the House now. Two members. One of which, not her, the, the other one. I can't remember a bloody name off the top of my head. But the other one was live tweeting where Nancy Pelosi was when the riot was going on. These are enemies of the people. That, that woman is a, this, a certifiable lunatic. This is the reason why America got in such a state. And it's the reason why the right wing in general, I don't mean, I mean the extreme right wing, I mean 
we should have a left and should have a right, we should have a middle, we should have a bit of sensible stuff and a, and a yeah. bit of balance. But this is extremism. Yeah. You know, they, they talk about, you know, um, uh, religion, Islam, uh, and causing extremism within that, uh, and al Qaeda and all the rest of it. This is the same. These are no nutters. different. No different. No whatsoever. different at all. No and I different. look at British politics as well. Yeah. And in British politics, if we had anyone like that, I know we got some nutters and we got some extreme nutters, but no one is stupid. They don't go as deep down the rabbit stupid. hole as her. She she deep does believe. Hell. She does believe. She absolutely believes that there are uh, pizza restaurants across the United States that are hiding kidnapped children underneath that uh, to be sold to Republican uh, or Democrat, sorry, I said that wrong, Democratic um, members of the House. They, She believes that a lot of people that are involved in government, only Democrats though, not Republicans, which is weird because if you did a percentage of how many um, sexual deviants there were in the Republican Party to the Democrats, I'd say, uh, who do you think's hanging around with hookers most nights? And she believes that they they are trafficking. They are paedophiles that are trafficking in uh, in kids, in children that are held for them, for them to buy underneath pizza restaurants across the United States. Madness. That woman Madness. believes that. That woman believes that. And you voted in Georgia, yeah, for our American viewers. When this all goes up and goes live throughout the week, and you all start watching it and sending me loads of crap about me looking like an Eskimo and stuff. The uh, yeah, just remember you voted. You voted for her. You got some points there, Mike. Yeah, that's uh, come up on our local YouTube uh, channel. Yeah, you can read them out. I am indeed. Uh, Nick is saying that uh, to do with your music comments oh, earlier, yeah. R- Ringo Starr, Roger Daltrey, Morrissey, uh, they were all on that side. So how was taking back control? Mark is saying uh, 94,000 deaths now, absolutely shocking yeah. and heartbreaking, and some people still question the whole thing. Yeah, getting on to these deniers. Uh, Robert Doyle saying it's shocking how many people have died over the past few weeks. The Christmas relaxation was a big mistake. It was hard, but we stayed at home, and I haven't seen my parents since last January. Well, good for you, Robert, yeah, and so did I. I, um, I just spent it with, uh, with a family and a, a good friend of mine. And um, he's saying they're... Uh, it, they're having their first jab on Monday, your uh, parents. So that'll be now. Well, let's Fantastic. hope you get to see them soon, Robert. I'll make sure um, you have the second one. Yeah, and Mark was actually pointing out before we had that video yeah. about Marjorie Green, Congresswoman, uh, introducing the impeachment. And um, and, he's, uh, and Nick is saying that Parler is up again on a Russian server. Surprise, so surprise. It's returned from the dead. It's up, but it's not quite up. I had a look before. Yeah. But... Trump has been pardoning people. Trump has been pardoning people. We were waiting with bated breath. The big one was, is he going to pardon the Tiger King? Because the Tiger King... No, it's true. The Tiger King, uh, for those of you who've seen the, the Netflix documentary, um, they, that was the, the first week of lockdown in March last year <laughs> was all the Tiger King. That was all anyone was watching and yeah. talking about. And this guy has become sort of a... He is a, an absolute right-wing lunatic, and he, yeah. he ran for president himself, and then uh, he didn't get anywhere, obviously. Yeah. And, and then he supported Trump like mad because he's very much like Trump. And he is now serving 22 years for trying to have a, in the most inept job I've ever seen of hiring a hitman to uh, to do away with a, a rival of his who had a rival zoo, um, Carol Baskin. Yeah. And also he was done for executing some some tigers that had grown into beyond cubs and he could no longer afford to maintain. So he's not this the the fun character that can be portrayed. He's in prison. He's not in prison by accident. There are a couple of issues there. Although twenty two years is a crazy long time for for if you look at the incident. So his uh, lawyers petitioned and went. Oh, we we believe Trump is going to come good for us. And they got a limo outside the prison. Yeah, on the morning waiting for Trump to issue his uh, pardon. So let's have a look at who actually did get pardoned. In his final hours in office, President Trump issuing a flurry of late-night pardons and commutations, including one for his former chief strategist, Steve Bannon, who helped Trump win the White House in 2016. 
Last year, Bannon pled guilty to charges he defrauded Trump supporters who donated millions to an online campaign called We Build the Wall. Bannon, among those accused of stoking the flames ahead of the Capitol riots, saying on his podcast the day before the attack, all hell will break loose tomorrow. All I can say is strap in. President Trump also pardoning rappers Lil Wayne and Kodak Black, who were prosecuted on federal weapons offenses, and former Detroit Mayor Kwame Kilpatrick, who was serving a 28-year prison term on corruption charges. Not on the list, Rudy Giuliani, Julian Assange, and Edward Snowden, or any members of the president's family, including President Trump himself. The outgoing president, not seen publicly in more than a week, releasing a video farewell address. I took on the tough battles, the hardest fights, the most difficult choices, because that's what you elected me to do. Arguing the movement he started is only beginning the president who's yet to congratulate President-elect Biden, never once mentioning him by name, offering these words for his successor. We inaugurate a new administration and pray for its success in keeping America safe and prosperous. President Trump also condemning this month's Capitol insurrection by his supporters without acknowledging he's been accused of inciting it. Political violence is an attack on everything we cherish as Americans. It can never be tolerated. Ahead of the president's impeachment trial, expected to begin within days, the Senate's top Republican, Mitch McConnell, who says he hasn't ruled out voting to convict President Trump, unequivocally denouncing him for his rhetoric before the riots. The mob was fed lies. They were provoked by the president and other powerful people. President Trump skipping time-honored transfer of power traditions, like welcoming the incoming president and first lady. Mr. Trump is instead eyeing a celebration of himself, departing the White House for the last time this morning, hours before Biden is sworn in, choreographing his send-off at Joint Base Andrews. The president said to have requested a red carpet, a color guard, even a 21-gun salute. But many top Republicans will not be there, including Vice President Mike Pence who, unlike the president, will attend Biden's inauguration at the Capitol. OK, so Steve Bannon, let's just get into this. Not only is he the most disheveled human being ever, you, you think he'd look in the mirror and someone had, had something in his head to go, have a shave, sort your shirt out, just sort your hair out. The guy looks like a demented bagman, you know, Does wandering it look the like streets. A, um, an Eskimo? Oh, get out. Are you going to leave that alone? Is that a thing now? Are you going to be T-shirts, merch just, with that on? Just a description again. Go on. Unshaven. Dishevelled. No, he said, he said an bit. Eskimo. Sort your hair out. They, you don't know why. Why is there a thing that Eskimos are scruffy? But I had to begin. And I don't think I'm scruffy. I've, I've tried my best. You I know. begin. Any, yeah, anyway, right. Back to this. Steve Bannon. Uh, why is he? Why was he up? And why is this so bad? What's happened? Obviously, they touched on it that he was raising funds for Trump's wall, yeah. and then it turned out that he he had taken the money and not given it to the wall. So he basically collected loads of money from the public, hundreds and hundreds of millions, and then took the money. Well, here's what they've missed out there. He actually spent it on this. If Chris can find the picture. He decided that it would be a great idea to start a right wing boot camp to produce future leaders that believe in taking down the new world order. And he bought a monastery on a hill in Italy that looks like it's out of a James Bond film. It looks like the lair of Blofeld with his white cat. It, all that's missing are a few... A few <laughs> cats. Yeah, it, that's all, that's, all that's missing there are a few nuclear missiles to, that he's kidnapped from some country. You know, it, it, it's absolutely insane. The guy is literally a James Bond villain. They, they get, the guy spent all that money on that lair. And then the Italian government, when they realised that he was literally doing a boot camp to educate people so that they could overthrow their government and all the other governments around the world because he wants a new world order. And by the way, these people who want a new world order, they all have one thing in common. They know how to tear it all down and governments. They have no idea about what comes after that. They're just hoping that something will emerge. They've no plans whatsoever. They're just sick of stuff and they want to wreck everything. So, yeah, that was it. And so the Italian government spent a year suing them and they, he actually beat them. And then just at the 11th hour when he thinks, oh, yeah, I'm doing all right here, that, that was when um, suddenly 
here's the funny thing. When you start to uh, hold interviews on CNN and other news channels at, from your weird monastery base that costs hundreds of millions of dollars, uh, the you might think that the tax service will have a look at you and go, <laughs> oh, Mr. Bannon, your returns show that you've had this amount of, and you've just bought that monastery on a hill that you were being interviewed with on TV. And they looked into his taxes and then they arrested him for stealing all the money. So he's not that clear. He is a very intelligent guy. But, but it's funny what he, ego he's, does, but isn't been it? pardoned. And now he's it's been right. pardoned. It's okay. And that says that that sort of shit is absolutely fine. I mean, it is a repugnant pardon. There, have there been worse ones? He, there's quite a lot of dodgy ones he's dished out. Yeah. But that one the in record, particular, the that one. number of pardons by any president whatsoever. Absolutely. In the past 200 but, years. But they're not to correct wrongs. Trump's pardons have never been to correct wrongs. They've been to repay people that have done him a dodgy favour. There was a whisper around that he could buy a pardon for two million, but it's only a whisper. Well, there you go. Whisper. Oh, I've got some news for you before go we on. go on to the next thing. Yeah. Uh, Mark's saying Liverpool are losing 1 0. Is that football again? Invading this that's, show. That's, um, this serious news show. That's cheered me up. Dear me. Well, um, it, uh, you, the right wing uh, are obviously watching everything the alt right, who, who really, really didn't want Trump to go and have, have uh, fueled the uh, election fraud hoax to the bitter end and were right on board with the insurrection. And, you know, they, uh, they uh, decided to wish Biden well. He's not president of the United States anymore, and I can't stand that. I really am disappointed, but we're going to be okay. We're going to thank this president. Wow, what a sacrifice that he made, his family made, the amazing things that he accomplished, and he'll be back. But today we did hear from him for the last time as president. A goodbye. We love you. We will be back in some form. So have a good life. We will see you soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good life. All right. Now he said back in some form. I think the president is going to watch and listen. He said he's going to do that and he's going to evaluate his future, the country's future, perhaps. I know, but it was sad seeing him leave the White House for the last time on Marine One, on Air Force One. But folks, now it falls to us, and he's been very inspirational. We now have to fight cancel culture, each and every one of us. We, each and every one of us, have to stand up for our constitutional rights. How do you feel about Joe Biden? He is the president of the United States. It's okay, ladies and gentlemen, to say you do not wish the president success. It is. Now, I wish him no harm, of course, and I want him to be happy and healthy in his life, but I wish Joe Biden no success. I don't want him to re-enter the Paris Climate Accord. It's okay to say that. I don't want him stacking the Supreme Court as he pretty much said he would during the campaign. I don't want him to succeed at that. I don't want him re-entering any nuclear deal that was so flawed with the Iranians. I don't want to see that. So it's actually okay to say you don't want to see Joe Biden succeed. Remember, he is the head of the executive branch, okay? And we've got three branches. They are all co-equal. Fair enough? Fair enough. Joe Biden uh, jumped the gun a little bit today. He got sworn in at 10 minutes to noon. I don't mean to nitpick, but um, it does say noon according to the law. But anyway, here's a bit from today. The cry for survival comes from planet itself. A cry that can't be any more desperate or any more clear. And now, a rise of political extremism, white supremacy, domestic terrorism, that we must confront and we will defeat. I hate white supremacy. I hate domestic terrorism. But um, we've got bigger problems than that. All summer long, this country was on fire. But Joe, for his liberal base, focused on what happened two weeks ago, and they're going to, it looks like, exploit that. This is uh, my neighborhood over the uh, summertime. You see this nonsense? It was happening in cities all across the nation. And Joe Biden, at the age of, what is he, 78, 
is suddenly, after 50 years in Washington, D.C., going to tackle issues of institutional racism and white supremacy. Joe Biden, a man who never sees race. The first sort of mainstream African-American yeah. who is articulate and bright and, and, and clean and nice-looking guy. I mean, it's, that's a storybook, man. Yeah. Joe Biden in his late 60s marveling that there could be a bright, articulate and clean African-American male. Something tells me that Joe Biden in his heart of hearts is not exactly woke. They are fucking lunatics. Clueless. Lunatics. Just they, they are not well. There's something wrong in the head. And, um, you know, without I, I hate to just rush into another video. But they, we, there are two parts to this. They yeah. The wonderful story that you've just seen there. That you, can I just say, those are the most rose-tinted glasses I've ever seen in my life, the way that he's looking at that. But it's nice to see him upset, though. I will say that. However, what? let's have a look at what Trump didn't deliver. Four years and one clear way to gauge a president's success or failure. Not simply whether they won re-election, but whether they left the country better than they found it. And by that measure, history will be brutal to President Trump. Because our country is more divided, more in debt, and less respected than it was before he took office. Let's look back at some of his inaugural promises to the American people. We will bring back our jobs. In fact, the unemployment rate in America is two points higher than it was when Trump took office. And that's after it spiked to over 14% after COVID-19 first hit. We will get our people off of welfare and back to work. There are more than twice as many people who filed for unemployment benefits than when he took office. We will bring back our wealth. In fairness, Wall Street has done very well under Trump with the Dow Jones up 56%. But the national debt, which Trump promised to eliminate over eight years, it surged by over $7 trillion. The deficit grew a stunning 429% on his watch. We will build new roads and highways and bridges and airports and tunnels and railways all across our wonderful nation. Unfortunately, no. Infrastructure week never happened, with Trump storming away from a $2 trillion bipartisan deal. We will make America safe again. Hate crime incidents rose almost 20% from 2016 to 2019, the most recent figures available. Despite all the flag hugging, the percent of people saying they're proud to be an American plummeted over the Trump years. And when it comes to foreign policy, the 2020 Pew survey found that Trump is less trusted by people in 13 allied nations to do the right thing than the autocratic leaders of Russia and China. And one of the few areas where we can say America first on the world stage is in coronavirus cases and deaths. Now, for those folks who say that all of these numbers would look very different if it hadn't been for the pandemic, remember, Trump was deeply unpopular before COVID hit. In fact, his Gallup poll approval average of 41% is the lowest of any president on record. And none of that includes his two impeachments, or the more than 30,000 false or misleading claims, or the chaotic management style that led to a 91% turnover of senior White House staff, while having more than twice the number of people in his inner circle indicted than the last four presidents combined. Now Trump will be the first president since Andrew Johnson to refuse to attend his duly elected successor's inauguration. He's apparently recorded his own video farewell address where he'll tout his record. But we already have the first lady's farewell address. It is full of true and worthwhile sentiments, but we thought it was missing some crucial context. To focus on what unites us, to raise above what divides us, to always choose love over hatred, peace over violence, and others before yourself. And that's your reality check. I think that's such an important and interesting way to look at it. And yes, it is worth going back and looking at the promises made, promises kept, but when history writes about the Trump presidency, I think the first two lines are going to be the twice impeached president who oversaw the death of 400,000 Americans in his last year in office. And it's hard to get beyond that. Absolutely. And also the platitudes that any of the leaders or the first lady speak are only soothing if you don't have videotape. 
if you have videotape or a memory of as long ago as two weeks, they don't make any sense in that context, actually. Yeah, and if you just look at some of the numbers, they're historic. I mean, he leaves the presidency with the lowest approval rating after one term of any modern president. Um, Melania Trump, and I do think it is worth noting, every first lady in polling has left the White House with a positive net approval. She's leaving with a negative net approval. It just doesn't happen. They are leaving this in, in an historically poor position, and I think it will be reflected. It seems like... Yeah, and uh, I'm glad they brought in uh, Melania there because she's an enabler. Everyone was going to save Melania and all the rest of it. Bollocks. She doesn't, didn't give a shit. She's sleeping with an obese, horrendous bloke who's locking kids up in cages. And she's still, they had separate bedrooms. She's she's not been sleeping with him for, a, they, they've not had sex once in the White House, trust me. And uh, at the end of the day, she's an enabler. She she watched everything Trump did and just stood there and, and let it happen. She allowed what sort of a woman would be okay with her husband bringing in policies that were separating kids from the parents and there's still hundreds of kids that need reuniting that hopefully Biden will do something about and we will hold him to account for this and the thing you will get on this show if Biden is a useless bloke if he is shit at this job you'll be get, we'll be going after him on this show believe me but here's the question all the votes, all the votes he got, his record number of votes for Trump, um, his supporters, will they continue this talk of a new party, Mike? Well, a new Republican party, do you, do you, will it happen? Well, he's lost Twitter. He's lost Twitter. Do you not think? Do you not think it was refreshing? Did you not think even before he left office, we had four or five <clears> days where wasn't it peaceful? Yeah, a little bit. Do I mean, you think, every morning I was checking it. I was I know, addicted to it. I know, and it was and it's it was so peaceful. So do you think that the supporters without that to feed on and There'll to be keep, other ways. I mean, there's just will be other ways. Are they uh, are they yeah. going to so they never going ever go they are never gonna upset this Biden presidency. I don't know. I mean, who knows? We we we, we, we don't know, but however we've got a little video clip to finish the show on uh, tonight, which sort of disheartens you really. It's from Channel 4, their news section. And you watch this and you think, there's no hope for us. And, and I think, is there any hope for the world? Because next week we're talking about Europe and the UK. These people here, I feel a bit sorry for them because they've been taken in like a cult. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, you can only hope that things don't carry on down this uh, and they have an epiphany moment. But I think uh, I'd love to argue with you, but uh, there's a bit of a nihilistic uh, streak in me about it. I, I just don't see them snapping out of this. And uh, But what, what a bummer to end the show on this. But we will be looking forward to seeing you next week uh, in the post-Trump era. The post-Trump era. So we'll see you next week. I'll finish on this video which i mean just watch it and then make your own mind up see you next week in boone's mill virginia bethlehem road leads you directly here to a shrine where a supersized donald trump appears christ-like on the front of this former church it's now a place where his devotees demonstrate piety to their earthly messiah by buying up chinese-made trump merchandise there's a trump train Knife all aboard. It's an unusual painting of the media as clowns. That's what your cap says here Trump still my president. There you go. The owner, Donald Whitey Taylor, had three meetings with Trump and insists business is booming even as their president reluctantly leaves office. He is the savior of the United States, but he's not God. Yeah. Yeah. Why do you say he's the savior of the United States? The liberals have gave it away. Obama's the worst thing that ever happened to America. There's a bit of a cult around Trump. Oh, sure. People, people love him. They admire him. So there's almost a religious devotion to him. I'd say it's just a cult, yeah. Donald Trump has taken advantage of this zealous devotion to stoke fear among his supporters about what Democrats might do. Now they're in charge. No, we got to protect ourselves. we got to protect ourselves from the other side. Buy all the guns you can, get all the ammunition you can. If they start any crap, wipe them out. There has, of course, already been violence. Five people died, including a police officer, during the storming of the U.S. Capitol, leading to Donald Trump's second impeachment. USA! USA! 
While the mob were united around a perceived election theft, the crowd was buried. Militia members mixed with QAnon conspiracists and off-duty law enforcement officers. Two of them were these Virginian cops who posed for a selfie inside the building, one giving the middle finger. The officers come from the small remote town of Rocky Mount and have now been charged with violent entry into the capital, which they both deny. Tell me what, yeah. One of them, Jacob Fracker, told me Capitol Police let them into the building that and that they did nothing right? wrong. So... You see uh, officers moving the barricades and just like, hey, come on. They're like, if you're coming, come on this way. It's safe this way, blah, blah, blah. It's like, okay, fantastic. The friend that you were with and you were pictured with is posting on Facebook and you're posting on that Facebook page as well saying, we attack the government. The Remember we that? being a blanket statement, you know what I mean? We as um, people who just want to be heard, people who don't want to sit by and let, you know, tyrannical things happen. We don't feel any, any responsibility for nope. the bigger picture of, of what is now seen as an assault on American democracy. No. You didn't see any vandalism, you didn't see any of the attacks going on at all, nothing. Not that. No. But it was going on all around. It was, but not while we were there. You felt that day that it was important because Donald Trump has supported the way you see America, right? Um, Over the police, Second Amendment rights. The military, national security, because, you know, I mean, he, he said it best. America first. Thank you for watching. I'm impressed. You've passed the IQ test and got this far, so let's press that button to do the last thing that helps us. It's got subscribe on it, you can't miss it, and please ring the bell for notifications of future videos.